It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur from the CBS Television News staff and Francis W. Carpenter of the Associated Press. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable John Sherman Cooper, Senator from Kentucky. Senator Cooper, as a member of the Armed Services Committee and a former officer in General Patton's Third Army, do you think that uh, Senator McCarthy's uh, recent attacks on the Army for what he called coddling communists were damaging to Army morale? I I'm certain that that uh, they've had a bad effect upon Army morale. But if you want to me to discuss this problem of investigations, I think I'd have to do it at a little more length. I see. Well, uh, tell me, do you think the President handled the uh, situation between McCarthy and himself well? Do you think I he could have taken a stronger position on it? I, mean, I take the flat position that he handled it well. I think that in, d in discussing this question, you've got to distinguish between a fight on communism and the conduct of investigations. As you know, the Congress has unlimited power to investigate, and properly so. And but now, when we're take, when we're investigating subjects like communism, which have the aspect of of criminal conduct, it, it is true that the very highest standard is needed in those investigations. And reluctantly, I think that my colleague has has. Uh, We've not had those exact standards at times, and recently there's been an encroachment upon the executive branch of the government. Well, well in this contact with the, uh, over the situation with President Eisenhower, do you think that the President has, as I said, taken a strong enough position on this? It's, it's always a question as to time and uh, position. I think he has. In his statement, he made it clear that, that, he, that certain standards must be observed in investigations. He pointed out the responsibility of the Senate. He made it clear that he would protect the executive branch when it should be protected. Now, whatever happens in the future, he's made a very, I think, decent, uh, fair, honorable uh, standard and base for any action that may be taken. Well, Senator, do uh, you think this is going to stop this uh, conflict on the executive branch and the Army? I doubt if uh, anything can ever be stopped uh, absolutely. I think it's entirely possible and probable that we'll still have some conflict. Well, Senator, <coughs> can we look at this uh, uh, problem of the Army from another angle? Secretary Dulles has on uh, some occasion said that if any uh, action is started against us or any part of the world that we will retaliate promptly. How does that square with the uh, cuts that have been made in the defense budget? Uh, frankly, uh, Mr. Carpenter, I'm glad to be talking to you. I remember our uh, pleasant associations in the past when I was a delegate to the UN. And you were there. I think that his speech has been misunderstood. I I didn't construe it myself that he would that it meant the United States would take retaliatory action mm -hmm. at any kind of a breach of the peace. I understood him to mean that they would keep their alternatives and their freedom of action and that if under the circumstances they thought that they should act, they would act promptly and with real power. Now, you've asked me about the defense. I am serving on the Armed Services Committee, and while there's been a great deal of uh, criticism about the cuts in the budget, I think you can only gauge our strength by the progress that's being made in the various uh, divisions and arms of our armed forces. Well, uh, I'd like, to, if you want me to, I'd like to talk about that. Well, Senator, uh, a cut in the defense budget has been made, another one is being talked about now. Do you think this is going to weaken our position as we go into these negotiations with the communists at, in Geneva? I'd like to tell you what our strength is. A year ago, when this administration came into power, we had 102 uh, air wings or groups, I always get them mixed up, and 92 of them combat. After a year, we have 115. One year from now, there'll be 120. Two years from now, there'll be 127. And there'll be jet uh, jet wings, uh, for their uh, combat wings. There's a progressive growing uh, strength.
brother in the army, while there'll be two divisions lost, we'll have the same number of combat teams. And in the Navy, it's approximately the same strength. I think they've cut out a lot of the waste, and we're getting a strong, well-balanced military force. Well, Senator, it looks like that we may be leading from strength then in Geneva in the conference. Uh, you have served in the UN with Secretary Dulles. Uh, would you care to say anything about the prospects of the Geneva conference where he will be sitting for the first time across the table from the Red Chinese delegation? I know how many, I know the many times you've seen the, uh, our representatives sitting across from the Soviet representative. And I remember one time in 1950 thing. when the <coughs> Chinese communists came to the United Nations. You can't ever look for any real progress, but I, I know that uh, in this instance, uh, Mr. Dulles uh, took some risk when he said that we would meet with the, and uh, we, we would meet at Geneva and we would agree that the com Chinese communists and the North Korean communists should be there. Uh, but we made our position clear about Korea We've made a position clear about Indochina. And I, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Dulles, as he did at Berlin, can strengthen our position before the world. Yeah. Well, uh, Senator, uh, as you've said, you have served under other administrations on the bipartisan foreign policy. Now, do you think there's any difference between the present administration policy and, and the one in which you had uh, formerly represented the Pretty United States? people ask that question. I think there is a difference. There's a difference in emphasis. Uh, this administration has placed more emphasis upon the East. I think there's a better balance and emphasis between the East and Europe. I think further this administration has made its position clear upon, uh, its upon certain areas. For example, in, in, in Korea we've made it clear that if war should begin again that we would not limit our methods and our, our, our means of acting. We wouldn't limit, we would, could strike at Manchuria we could use the atom bomb. We've made a position clear on Formosa. We have made, I think, our position clear on Indochina. We have uh, made it uh, clear in, in Europe that uh, the Europe must uh, take steps to create the European defense community if uh, they are to expect our continued aid. And finally, I think we've made it clear that uh, we'll not limit any means that we have to protect ourselves if an aggression should come. I think it's a stronger position. Well, Senator, you yeah. are on a <coughs> committee to study revision of the United Nations Charter. Do you think that uh, we ought to eliminate the veto from that charter if it possibly could be done? No, I do not. I know that uh, in the past when the United Nations have been criticized, we usually point to the veto of the Soviet Union and the Security Council. But you know that we wanted the veto, and we certainly wouldn't give it up now. Uh, because with all of the criticism that's being directed against the United Nations, as evidenced lately by the debate upon the Bricker Amendment, I don't think we'd ever agree to uh, let some other country or group of countries direct our action without our being able uh, to uh, use the veto. Well, Mr. Carpenter, and, <coughs> and I remember when you served under other administrations, and we regard you as an expert on the UN now, sir, uh, now, you are appointed to this panel of the eight senators which are studying possible revisions to the Charter. Have you made any conclusions at all, any recommendations as to what should be done when this matter comes up before the Assembly in 1955? Our committee is made up of six members of the Foreign Relations Committee and then two appointed by the Vice President. I'm, I happen to have been appointed and Senator Holland of Florida as a, uh, makes the other member. We've had uh, several hearings. Uh, Secretary of Dulles, uh, Ambassador Lodge have testified and we, have, we are proceeding with the idea that uh, there's not the greatest chance in the world for revision because the Soviets can veto any proposed change. But everyone believes that uh, this discussion and our proposals and the hearings throughout the country can have a valuable effect in uh, correcting um, in the public mind many of the uh, assumptions about the UN which we think are not correct and which can and actually strengthen the UN for the people of the United States. Uh, Senator, why do you think the, uh, con the convention on uh, revising the charter should be held? Uh, there's some thought that it might go to San Francisco. Do you think it, uh, it should, might go out there when they meet? I haven't heard it discussed, but I remember that uh, everything that I've heard from the delegates who are at San Francisco has always been good. 
it may be that they look back upon that time as the rosy and halcyon days of the United Nations when everyone hoped for peace and cooperation. It, it would be a good place, I think. Well, Senator, uh, Mr. Carpenter and I remember you as a vigorous defender of a bipartisan foreign policy. Do you think there is a bipartisan foreign policy now? Yes, I think so. I think the test is this. In the various measures which affect foreign policy and which have come before the Congress, there's been almost uh, unanimous consent and votes upon those measures, with the, with the exception of the Bricker Amendment. And both Republicans and Democrats have joined together in support of those measures. And I think that's the real test. Well, Senator, may I ask you as a final question, do you think there should be changes in the rules of procedure governing the Senate investigating committees? Well, I, the, the trouble is today there aren't many rules. <laughs> and I think that, that uh, I doubt if you can have a very strict code, but I think each committee has a responsibility of setting up its own code of procedure. I think the Senate and the House ought to set up some minimum standards. But finally, it gets back to the conscience of those who are on the committee and to their own willingness to observe standards. And that depends at last upon the public opinion. Well, thank you very much, yeah. Senator Cooper. Privileged to have you here tonight. Well, I've enjoyed being here and discussing in a rather general way these subjects. Good to see you again. Mm -hmm. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Francis W. Carpenter. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable John Sherman Cooper, Senator from Kentucky. The reputation of Longines watches results not alone from the superior quality of conventional wristwatches for men and women, but as well from a complete line of complicated technical timepieces of the very finest quality. Now here are a few of the literally dozens of specialized Longines watches used in aviation, exploration, in the timing of sporting records, in astronomy, and in other scientific fields. You see, Longines traditionally makes watches in one way only, and every Longines watch, for whatever purpose, must be the best of its kind. Now today's Longines watches are the fruit of almost a century of experience in making watches of the highest character, an achievement acknowledged by 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now these facts must point to a definite conclusion. And if you wish to buy and own, or proudly give just about the finest watch made anywhere in all the world, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. And many beautiful Longines models are priced as low as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. The whole nation this week will be singing happy birthday to the Girl Scouts of America on this 42nd anniversary. Join us as we wish many happy returns to this growing force for freedom. <laughs>